All right, without further ado, we have finally cleared the airspace for Chart Trader. Brett Manning, how are you today? Doing pretty good, Jim. How you doing? I'm doing all right. So you were up uh, in the wee hours of the night making some money, juggling some kids, changing some diapers. Uh, I guess it was, uh, and, and not only that, uh, writing writing some uh, some memoirs out there for our listening community. So it sounds like you have a lot on your mind today. Um, well, you know, I don't know if I'd say that. It's a, it's an interesting environment, and I think that there's a uh, there's a lot of opportunities. I I felt that it was a good point last night to just kind of take a moment and circle back around to what's really important in terms of trading success, which isn't so much about whether or not there's a trade deal with Mexico or China or whether or not there's you know what what we end up getting from the Fed. It's more about you know managing your relationship with the opportunities that you get in the market. So I just kind of, I like to every once in a while cast a spotlight back on the, the psychological process involved. And and really, you know, it's a good situation. It's a good time for me to do that because uh, over the last couple of weeks, it's been a really strong couple of weeks for me, and yet there's been a ton of big missed opportunities. And it's important to kind of focus on staying within the game that you play and taking advantage of the opportunities and not opening the door to larger losses by getting frustrated with missed opportunities. And at the end of the day, you look back and it's been a really good stretch. So I, I just kind of wanted to reaffirm some of those concepts. And again, I, you know, it was, I don't know, what was it, two, three in the morning, something like that. And it just kind of, maybe I was a little bit, you know, in a philosophical mood. Well, it sounds like you're in a philosophical mood most days, I would say. Uh, so, uh, I guess you know if you're if you're already up and, and trading in in the night session, you got to do something to occupy your time. It doesn't quite have the same type of movement. Uh, I was an overnight trader for a long, long time, Brett, so I know how it can get into the doldrums, and you can just get into that philosophizing mood uh, oh, yeah. in in those wee hours. Anyway, so. Why don't we break down a few things? Uh, we'll we'll start with the equity market because you've been on both sides of this one today. You went in with a long. I was actually thinking that you might be looking to fade this, but uh, the market uh, threw an opportunity to you. you. Took a little scalp profit on that Dow and then came back. Uh, I think you scratched out of it or a small small loss in that balance, whatever. But uh, you did time that that Dow spike really really well. So maybe we'll just I got start. A little lucky. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's start with what you were looking at. I gotta, I gotta get the Dow chart going. So why don't you just uh, prep it, and I'll get the Dow chart back. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I was looking at initially. I was on a knife edge about whether I was shorting the NQs or buying the Dow, and um, I wanted to ultimately do both. I wanted to buy the Dow and then short the Nasdaq, and I wanted to see the Nasdaq squeeze up through seventy-two fifty and really put a capper on this on kind of a two-day squeeze that really just kind of cleaned out short interest. I really wanted to see a Dow long up until the NASDAQ flushed out above 7,300 and then um, turn around and fade the NASDAQ. That was kind of, that was the perfect possibility and you know the reality was I should have just been shorting the NASDAQ right off the bat. Uh, I say I got lucky because I, I got lucky. I put the trade on it two minutes later, a Boeing headline hit and Boeing's the highest weighted uh, member of the Dow. I'm not even sure what the headline was, but it's very clear to me looking at the one-minute chart for Boeing that, um, you know, I got lucky as far as the timing there. And so as soon as I saw the Boeing spike, I just I took profits on a piece of the position to move the stop up. But, you know, we got, we got interesting two-way action. I, I would still like to see a further squeeze just to get the sense that we've really cleaned out some of the pessimism and, 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 and have set up a more substantial and sustained possibility of a pullback inside of this. And right now, uh, in my morning notes, I kind of pointed out the possibility that we're in a kind of chop zone, and, um, and that's what it's looking like. Yeah, I was looking at the S&P a little bit here and the SPY, and I've got this uh, trend line that I drew. Um, you can probably see it on the Trader Audio screen, but uh, long story short, I drew this downward sloping trend line that connects the highs from our uh, uh, May 1st highs and just, uh, you know, it, it, it slopes down. Is it the same one I post posted yesterday? It might be. I, I don't have it up. I've, I've got so many windows open right now, Brad, I'd get lost, um, and so I don't want to lose all everything that we got. But I do find that uh, on the SPY chart, uh, today's high is a key inflection point for me. Uh, do you read it the same way that I do? 
you mean in terms of the trend line test? Yes, and where, yeah, so yes, and where we close relative to it. Sure. Yesterday I posted uh, mid-afternoon a post saying that I thought that we would see 2810 to 2815 as primary resistance, and it was kind of confluence of things, including that trend line. And I have it drawn on like a like a 60-minute chart or 150-minute chart or something. But it's I think it's the same trend line. Yeah, I wanted to see that blown out. But then we got action through that zone overnight, and it opened up the possibility that we would move the laggard index up to the similar kind of point, um, which would mean the NASDAQ blowing things off. And that's where we saw the most skepticism, I think, after the uh, after the the, the 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 FTC headlines from a couple days ago. I think that that's really become kind of the area. That's why I would want to short the NASDAQ and buy the Dow if we're moving two-way. Um, it just seems to be where the kind of relative strength to relative weakness disparity is right now, and maybe we'll, we'll kind of stay in place that way as the the strategic menu um, but yeah I mean I that is that's an important point I would really like to see a two-day kind of chop zone just underneath that trend line and then blow out the trend line and then move back under it that's a typical way that I kind of view these sequences just to see the 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 initial fades come in here people fight for it a little bit and then give up and then hand the position off to me when it can actually work I mean I, I think in those terms an awful lot so uh, that's what I would like to see, and I could kind of imagine uh, a two or three day chop zone here. I think that it's wide enough, given the volatility, that there's still plenty of trading setups inside of it. But um, as far as the key inflection, I'd like to see one more poke through the trend line. As far as the trading action went yesterday, I viewed it somewhat along the lines of what a bear market rally looks like. And I'm not sure because we're not in bear market territory yet. However, the way that it set up yesterday, the way it traded, as aggressive as it was, had the makings of, of what it is. In your experience, is, is it ever a, a uh, initial glimpse of what may be to come? Or am I just reading a little too much into it on a one-day move? No, I think that what you're talking about is something I call mode. And... Um, I think you're recognizing a modality. And I would say, I say this a number of ways. One of them is spikes on the upside, grinds to the downside, is kind of that same feel. Another way to look at it is the difference between a wall of worry and a slope of hope. And um, yeah, I would agree with you. It's got a little bit of a slope of hope feel to it right now, um, where you're getting, if you think of a typical strong bull market period, the, 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 the kind of underlying psychological tone to the action during a sustained advance in the market is usually a wall of worry kind of feel. You've got not necessarily the best news, but the market keeps making new highs. Um, but you see some real growth going on at the same time, but a lot of scary things out there that kind of keep sentiment in line. Um, and the pullbacks are sharp and on headlines. And the recoveries are slow and grinding and not on headlines. And that's just kind of the mode of behavior of a strong bullish trend. And the mode of behavior in a bear market is usually um, you know, sell-offs that don't necessarily have any direct catalyst, but then headlines come out and the market squeezes higher, or you know, there's solutions being offered up to solve all of the problems that are ailing the market. Um, a lot of times it's monetary policy that kind of spikes and squeezes things out. And yeah, I mean, you tend in that kind of mode of behavior to get rallies, sharp rallies and squeezes on headlines that go against the grinding direction of the trend. And, you know, it's just kind of the, the inverse of what you see in a, in a wall of worry kind of bull market advance. Like we saw, you know, all of 2013, a lot of 2017. Um, that kind of sustained grinding trend. And, and so far, you know, you can look at what we've seen since the uh, April-May high area um, as being a kind of grinding trend to the downside interspersed with spiking rallies that are driven by headline proposed solutions to the problems. Um, and so that mode is, is evident. You know, I think you've got to be careful about getting too quick to pronounce this a bear market, but I think a bear market is much more about mode than it is about magnitude. And, um, you know, magnitude will come, but the mode of a bear market usually starts to implant itself early on. You see a shift in the way the market is behaving. So I think that, um, and again, I think that all of this really is, is a discussion about, really, I think it's about um, the turtles, the turtle beach idea of the cycle. And really about, I don't think it's about whether or not there are tariffs on Mexico. 
Um, I don't think that that is really going to determine how we progress. I think really this is about whether or not we built up enough vulnerability, we got uh, an excessive acceptance of risk last year and in late 2017 on a big cyclical level did we build up enough vulnerability that if we start to see a positive feedback loop or self-reinforcing feedback loop of growing risk aversion is there enough vulnerability built into the system to exploit so that as we progress down levels as we see uh, some weakness in the labor market and maybe we see uh, banks tighten up a little bit in terms of credit flow. Does that, because of the vulnerability that's built up in the system, is there enough vulnerability to expose new levels of risk that start to emerge because they're not, there are they're situations that exist in the world that are not built for lower levels of risk acceptance, that are, that are not built for greater levels of risk aversion, generally speaking. So if the bank starts to tighten up a little bit, um, if the job market gets a little more difficult, do we have a bunch of people that are carrying way too much debt, way too little savings, companies that are in the same situation, and banks that have overextended the risk on their balance sheets? Is that there underneath the surface? So that as we start to peel away layers of risk acceptance, do we start to expose the type of problem that makes a contraction inevitable? And I think that the trade discussions are more or less uh, catalyzing a test of that right now. And um, I think that the Fed funds futures and what you're seeing in gold is just kind of showing a little bit of, um, you know, that that's in play, that we could be kind of flirting with exposing uh, some dominoes uh, in terms of the cycle that really wouldn't be solved by a new NAFTA deal or something. Like those become side issues in the context of gradually seeing risk aversion take on a life of its own because, you know, companies are not seeing lower sales so they start to fire people. As those people lose their jobs, they have a tough, job, get a tough time getting another job. Uh, the bank's not going to offer them any more credit. It starts to become, you know, wide enough spread that the the different segments of the household, business, banking, private sector part of the economy starts to react, feeding back into itself toward risk aversion, and that's really what happens in a contraction cycle. And it, it's tough to say whether or not we've started down that road, but I think that that would certainly be the important thing if we have started down that road that would define this trend in terms of the mode that you're starting to pick up on in terms of the nature of the action, if that makes sense. Yes, it makes sense to me. Now let me tell you one of my worries, and it's really kind of come down the pike recently, I'll, I'll say. So let's back up to December, and back then we were in the in the the investor sentiment or tone whatever however you want to uh, however you want to um, uh, play the narrative but we were in the in the mode of we're looking at a potential of three rate hikes and then all of a sudden the market Cuts. oh, oh no, I see. No, yeah no, no, no. Right. in I got december that. in december I got right? right and then yep. that that played into the market played into psychology market goes down we make our december lows Six months later, Brett, we are only six months from that, and we're already talking about three rate cuts. Now, the flip-flop of the Fed has me concerned. Well, yeah, I mean, and so, like, you have to look at, um, and we talked about this last strategy meeting. We brought back up that interesting term called the Wu Jia shadow rate. And um, it's, it's, it sounds like some kind of thing you see on a market conspiracy site or something, but it's, it's actually you know, a, a central tool used now by the Atlanta Fed, and it's very well established in economic literature as a tool to be able to understand the effective policy rate under the zero lower bound based on some of the tools that the Fed is using that are non-conventional or alternative tools, such as we've seen so, so frequently over the last 10 years. And um, it just measures where the rate really is down there because you have assumptions about uh, forward contracts and swaps heading out that give you, you a sense of where you people are behaving as if in terms of their market participation in in credit markets people are behaving as if the rate were x and so you can establish based on the pricing of different things and i don't fully understand it but i understand it well enough to explain it that way um, and, I, and I think that's reasonably well hinged as an explanation, um, that, that you can see where the effective policy rate is, and it can be quantified precisely. And if you look at where the Fed got down to by, I think, July 2014 was when that measure bottomed. That was the easiest we got. Um, 
I think it was around three, negative 300 bips. And so to get to where we are now, 225 to 250 on the positive side, is, you know, you're talking about 5% hike in rates, a hike cycle. And that is over the grand sweep of history, you know, that's a that's a that's a full cycle. And um and when you go, you know, five percent of tightening of policy over the course of an expansion that's this old, and then you start to see clusters of rate cuts. I don't think there's any time in history except for nineteen ninety five where that was not the beginning of a snowballing process toward a contraction in the bear market. So that's certainly something to think about. Now it may be that it's different this time. Just like it was different in nineteen ninety five, that was a peculiar situation. And maybe this is a more proactive version of the Fed. It may be that going through what it went through in 2008 has redefined the Fed. It may be that modern monetary policy, or MP3, as Ray Dalio calls it, is is a, is, a, is an entirely new era that's beginning, and, and that there's a whole new statistical relationships between Fed behavior and market behavior that we're beginning to establish. So you can't necessarily say, well, this you know, if we do three rate cuts by the end of the year, this guarantees, you know, we are at a cyclical turning point, and we are somewhere in the process of the beginning stages of a bear market now. Um, but, you know, over the course of history, generally speaking, when you have a full rate uh, a tightening cycle and then you start to see the Fed move in the opposite direction and people pricing it aggressive and sudden moves in the opposite direction, then that would, you know, typically signal that you're, you know, you're seeing the sorts of things you see when the when when the, the the downside part of the cycle begins to manifest itself and um, and that's certainly a reasonable view and uh, I don't think you need to know the answer right now but it's good to understand that that's the narrative that's playing out and kind of think in terms of a common knowledge game large money managers are seeing that too and they're going to behave the way they're going to behave and it's one of the reasons why the gold position is interesting certainly the reason why the Treasury's market has acted the way that it has um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that yeah, when you see when you see the Fed start to turn in terms of its behavior at at this point in the cycle, certainly with the age of the cycle, and certainly with the the magnitude of of tightening that we saw, it it, it implies at least the possibility that you're beginning the process of the cyclical downside part of the cycle. Yeah, and it, I'll tell you, we were only off by like five percent from all time highs in S and P, and already talking, you know, more and more rate cuts. It, it, it has me worried. It has me worried that they just don't quite have the control that we perceive that they do. Well, they certainly don't. We know that. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, yeah, right. So and maybe you could look at the cycle that way, that the upside of the cycle is the period in which people believe that they have an actual control over how things go, and the downside part of the cycle is where you start to realize that it's it's more or less, you know, hit and miss on that level, and that the cycle's been taking care of itself. And I think that's probably true for the most part. I mean, there's a finger on the scale, and 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 certainly that can exhibit a strong impact a lot of times, but when you start to see a self-reinforcing feedback loop of risk aversion, then you will quickly see that what the Fed does doesn't seem to have a tremendous amount of impact, and the, you know, the interesting thing here is that, you know, they're, they're really, we've got that, uh, we've got the effective policy rate at having been below uh, zero by quite a bit, and the question is, could they get it back down there again? It doesn't matter. It's not a, a, a mechanical relationship. Remember, we're understanding the Wu Jia rate as, as a manifestation of how people are behaving relative to credit markets in the private markets based on what the Fed has done, not simply the Fed doing something. So quantitative easing doesn't necessarily sink rates way down below the zero lower bound. They have to uh, get a herd of people behaving that way based on what they're doing. And as we saw in the narrative following that, there was a lot of research suggesting that, you know, there's there's a belief now at the Fed and current Fed leadership that there's a kind of diminishing returns to something like quantitative easing, where it gets harder and harder based on their behaviors, their communications policy, and their buying of assets to actually get that herd moving the way they want them to. So it, it's questionable to think whether or not they could cut that effective policy rate that far below zero in the next downside cycle. So it kind of... It, it, it creates this narrative, I think, that's grown up around modern monetary theory where you know, maybe people are kind of, of, of realizing that the Fed, if they get back to the zero lower bound, may have a difficult time um, inspiring people to behave as if policy is well below zero. And, um, and, and, and maybe that wouldn't even be that healthy. And so we're kind of dealing with the question of, well, if we've already got, you know, I mean, 
in a contraction situation, one and a half trillion to two trillion dollar deficits, how do we reconcile ourselves with the need to still use fiscal tools even under those circumstances? And I suppose that's maybe the the birth call of modern monetary theory is that you know we start to just go okay we're going to go way off into theory land here and just say it's fine to run four trillion dollar deficits and monetize it with the fed which i guess would be the idea as long as there's no inflation you can run theoretically infinitely high deficits and monetize it using the central bank um it just seems like that's just you know it's it's difficult to process that as something other than a, a justification of things that have been tried in the past that have led to some problems. So um, I, I don't know where it's headed, but again, that's the kind of the point of the gold trade is just I think that people are going to face those questions, and maybe it won't turn out to be a problem at all, but just facing those questions will probably have a, 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 a an impact on asset pricing as you start to kind of deal with not understanding the meaning of what sorts of tools are suddenly being put into play and not knowing what the impact of that will be and needing to really diversify in terms of how you approach asset management, particularly for, for large asset managers. All right, so let's get back just to the equities and far as what you're going to be keen on over the next coming sessions. I know we have a lot of data points that we have to consider, some macro data. We have some central bank speak. We also have the jobs data out on Friday. What are going to be the key things that you're going to be watching that's going to set up the next trade for you? Or the next idea, so, not not necessarily next trade, but the next kind of thematic idea for you in the equity. Well, I'm going to answer both questions. Okay. The, the next trade is I would like to, I have a bearish bias and an unfulfilled setup. So um, what I would like to see is what gives me the feeling that we have uh, taken people who've been aggressively trying to fade this and really blown them out. And then... I get the, 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 the hallmark sense of a short time frame pattern that shows me that it's that wily e. coyote who's standing, you know, several feet off the edge of the cliff and holding the sign saying, oh, no, you know, but, but I would like to see that above 7,300 in the NQs, and I think that would be just a golden setup, and I think it's, I think it's, I think it's possible. It may take a couple of days to do that, and there probably will be some short time frame setups that I take a look at in the interim, but I think that's the one where I sense the possibility of seeing a setup that could turn into something that's genuinely a very big trade, um, you know, at least uh, a couple hundred points of, of NASDAQ points in a single trade that I can gather in reasonably. I think that would set that sort of thing up. So um, there's the trading setup idea as far as equities is concerned. Uh, as far as the themes, I really think that it comes down to um, we had inflation data next week in retail sales. And that could actually, you know, jobs obviously Friday. So jobs Friday. Um, and then inflation data and retail sales, and you really have kind of, I mean, you've got a, a, a very important cross-section of the driving economic data there when you've got inflation, labor, and consumption activity. And, and that gives us all of that just a couple of days, then you know, two weeks from today is the the June Fed meeting. And I think it's not impossible that if we get some more hiccups, if we confirm ADP in Friday's jobs data, and then we see, you know, some clear continued softness in CPI, and then we see maybe a downside surprise in retail sales, I think you're going to see the drumbeat for a cut in two weeks. And I think that um, the immediacy of that is going to be an important step for the market. Who, who may still be thinking, you know, there may be plenty of people who are still thinking, well, there's all this, you know, trade uncertainty and it's caused people to get a little jittery, but ultimately at the end of the day, the economy is still strong and blah, 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 and we can still have faith in certain positions. And then you take those kind of holdouts and start to turn them into weaker hands, and, it, and it, I think it shifts the equation a bit. Um, and I don't, I think that that cut would be one to fade, so... All right, so that, that, that yeah, that kind of shores up the equities. I do want to talk to you about crude oil. Man, oh, man. Man, I missed that today. Let me just well, say that. Not, not, well, not only that. Talk Setup about, is beautiful. The, well, talk about missing things. These darn analysts, man. They're just, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. That was, that, that was the worst was yet. I sat, 
Yeah, I don't worry about them. I just the pattern was obviously. I don't think it would have mattered what the data was. We were going to see a breakdown. I just wanted the data to get behind us first. I just wanted to. I mean, there's just this beautiful three-day sideways range descending triangle. If you just look at a, an hourly chart of crude oil, all right, it's just it's spectacular, you know. And it just I didn't want to do it before ADP. I wanted to do it after, and I just wanted that to try to spike off the day to maybe above 53.35, and then move back down through 53, and it just would have been spectacular as a short and I wouldn't have even cared what the data was the pattern was just I think an inevitability and, and I guess in the reality is then I probably should have done it small and wide in front of the data but I just I like to just get past you know I like to get past uh, Wednesday uh, at 10 30 a.m. Eastern before I start trading crude for the week it's just been you know that it's it's really Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, and Friday is when the crude market is something that I look at as an active trading prospect and the pattern was just spectacular for a sharp breakdown and I just really am kicking myself on that one but you know it goes back to what I posted overnight like I don't I'm not actually beating myself up for that I can just see that it would have been a very easy setup and it just it went on the data and it I didn't have access to it that's okay yeah, and that's I, hey, I, t I talk that all the time. You know, I, I throw out trade ideas, and sometimes they don't ever come to fruition. And hey, the sun comes up another day. I'm still living. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm. You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not scrambling because I put myself in a bad position, and it, it just didn't work out. I'm going to move on to the next opportunity. It's like being a field goal kicker. You know, you miss a kick, you got to come back and kick it again. You never know when the next uh, when the next one's going to come. So. I do want to sure. Ask well, just just let me circle back around. Just highlight again for people who didn't read my overnight comment. The real the the, the pull through further of that philosophical choice, the one that you just outlined, and the one that I outlined as well. The 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 most the, the really important part of that is if you beat yourself up for missed opportunities, it will cause you to take bad setups in the future, and it leads to a psychological spiral of destruction. And it really is, I think, kind of the cornerstone of. Of, of maintaining the right kind of mental state related to your trading is to just never, ever give yourself a hard time for missing an opportunity. So there you go. Now go ahead. Yeah, and that's definitely the psychological mindset you have to do because not being able to pull the trigger is a big problem. That's a big problem for a lot of traders when they've gone through, let's face it, everyone has their cycles of, of weaker times where sometimes you're firing and but a lot of times you're not and a lot of times you're just scratching you're you're spinning your wheels a lot of times and you can get into that mental mindset of oh this is not working oh this is not going to work oh I'm going to get luck I just have to get lucky and you you can go into that downward spiral very very easily you can talk yourself into bad trades you can talk yourself into uh, just just negative sentiment in your own brain of uh, how how things d don't work out and missing opportunities will be th that thing that will just ring in the back oh I should have got this one oh I should have stayed up all mm -hmm. night and then all the next thing you know you're you're just spinning yourself Especially, out you know, of control. you're afraid of missing the next one yeah. and then it's not really there but you force it and it's in a tough tape and and then it just spirals yeah. and it just it's so important to realize that not beating yourself up for missed opportunities is the key to avoiding that just enjoy it relax take the ones that are obvious to you if you if you think about something it goes you didn't get it no big deal just move on and and just stay in that productive constructive mindset and it will it, the broad sample will work out and the other thing to guard against is beating yourself up over ideas that were the right idea it was the right play it just didn't work out do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You know, you, um, you, you put on... The, give me, the, give yeah. me a theoretical example, hypothetical example. Well, okay. I'll give you a hypothetical example. I'm staring at the, the one-hour crude oil trade. And the trade that you said is, hey, I was looking for a short in the crude oil ahead of the data. I, I, it was an easy trade to me. And I was looking for the descending, or the, the, uh, descending triangle. And I went ahead and put that trade on. I had my risk completely in check everything worked out, uh, everything worked out except the trade so oh you mean it was falsified it was, it, yeah it was the right idea yeah. it was the right idea you weren't scared to pull the trigger you everything lined up you did it and it just didn't work out let's say it didn't work out i guess 
Sure, and I guess I think of that in my thousand thousand uh, parallel universes metaphor. The way, the way that I would understand the concept of the right idea, it, it takes a, a sufficient amount of experience to be able to reasonably, with conviction, at least to yourself in your internal psychological environment, to understand that you know in six hundred of those universes the trade worked out, but you just happen to be living in one of the other four hundred, mm -hmm. and that's okay. And yeah, you just I mean you have control over how you behave. You don't have control over what the market does. That's right. So, and th that's the point I want to stress. If your process is right, it just didn't work out. You live to fight another sure. day. That's the that's the big thing. Don't compound it either. All right. So, last thing here for crude oil. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the Fibonacci lines from the December lows up to the April highs. Drew a Fibonacci uh, retracement in that one, and now we've breached the 38% uh, um, pullback, um, or it would be, I guess. Um, the 60. Hold on. Let me get. Let me. Let me get the uh, daily chart so it looks. Are you able to see the trader audio screen? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, you can see where I drew the lines. I got this daily chart up, and now, uh, it, it says 38.2 on my line, but really it's it's the the 62% uh, retracement from the highs. Now. Right. Uh. What do you do here? Uh, what what typically do you look for? Do you want it to, to get back above where we'd see that Fibonacci level? Or do you think this now sets up for a run back down to the old lows, down at the $42 level? No, I mean, I think you've got a test of just under 50-50. That's the level that I would be looking at. Okay. So, uh, so... I mean, eventually it may be down there. I, I just mean, this... this sequenced linear market experience of this aggressive decline mm -hmm. it will I, I I would be I would be uh, uh, thinking in terms of um, what's today's low uh, today's low is 50 60 oh it's got there I didn't even yeah, realize 50, it at 60, all yep, okay. yep. Yeah, I mean, I would look for, you know, uh, I, I would want to see a flush of 50-50 down to 50-35. Um, it's weird, but that number just sticks in my head. It's amazing how many turns I've seen at a 0.35 of, of a level in crude oil. It's just an insanely common thing in my experience. I can't explain it. Um, and maybe I've invented some kind of logical ghost, but I, I really, it's been so many experiences of seeing um, that, that, you know, 30 to 40, zone to 35. So I would see a flush of 50-50 orders, and then you get people who are coming in to buy ahead of a test of 50, and maybe really you have kind of expunged that loose money, and then you go into a consolidation of some kind. And then I would make a decision about where the market is headed on a larger time frame based on how that consolidation played out. I would not think we would immediately go straight through to flush the 50 level on this move without some kind of consolidated period first. That would be my gut feeling. All right. Uh, if we did, I think I would make a case, uh, let's see, uh, 47. 47 would be my uh, puke target. So if we see a flush and a puke, uh, 47 would be where I'd be uh, gunning for uh, maybe maybe a test down to. So uh, that's just my quick take on it. Okay. All right, Brett, are there any other markets that we should be highlighting? Um, so I think that um, when we talked, uh, I, it might have been last week in the strategy meeting, um, we noticed that there was that eat the tail setup in the euro on the weekly chart. Mm -hmm. And you asked me, what are the risks for the euro? And I initially interpreted it as, what are the risks for the big short trade in the euro? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that we are specifically seeing that. It's exactly what I said when I thought that's what you were asking, which is a meaningful deterioration in assumptions about the economic health of the United States. That's exactly what's happened in the last week, specifically. Um, we are seeing the Fed funds futures take off. If you remember, just a week ago, we were looking at maybe one cut in September, maybe not. And now suddenly it's, it's a cut in July, maybe June, two cuts by September, three by the end of the year, and we're seeing you know a jobs data number like we saw today. So this is convergence in theory so far we are seeing convergence because the other big the, the 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 importance of the pair with the euro and the dollar is there is a convergence divergence idea between the united states and the rest of the world and you go through periods the cycle has been defined by that process of are we in convergence or divergence is the united states uh, uh coming back into the fold with the rest of the pack of the world or or, or is it is it continuing to uh, break out away and have a different financial and economic destiny. Um, and, and 
you know, at this point, the euro trade is really about whether or not convergence or divergence is going to define the you know the next several months. Um, if you see you know suddenly jump in inflationary data in the U.S., the jump in jobs, a big jobs report on Friday, surprise, you know, uh, a big retail sales number, Fed funds futures start to leak back down to no cuts even in September, um, you're back in divergence territory and the euro falls off the table. Um, but what we're seeing right now is convergence back in. The, the United States is starting to uh, slip back into the fold of the herd with the rest of the world in terms of where the cycle looks. It's a fragile state, possibility of contraction looming, uh, the need for central banks to go out of tightening mode and into uh, easing mode. Um, all of that defines this chart, and you've got a big short position sitting there, so that short position is reacting sharply to that. And where the dollar goes, I, I, I think of it as like, if you think of the financial universe, the financial landscape, the global markets, um, as something like a metaphor, metaphorical uh, with the, or analogous to the solar system, then the dollar is the sun. Everything is most simply organized around that as the feature market that really has the most important impact. And this idea would be a weakening dollar, which is another little bit of a cushion for um, how we handle the next couple of months. Ultimately, where the data goes is going to eventually be where the market goes, but it allows things to brace a little bit. And maybe it helps you know, crude oil find that low above 50. Um, and it certainly helps gold possibly find its way above 1350. And I guess that would be the other market to point out again. Um, if you uh, can put, can, can you possibly put a gold chart up on a weekly time frame? Yeah, if you give me one second, I will. Uh, sure thing. Just let me move these things out of the way. And there we go. Okay, so you can see this gigantic uh, bullish ascending triangle pattern that appears to be flirting with the top. Yeah, I mean, what you'd want to, yeah, so if you can scroll it back far enough to see the whole of 2014 to 2019, basically, you can really see the, uh, yeah, it's see not, the whole uh, thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I gotta really, uh, I gotta really scrunch this one. So, sorry yeah, about exactly. that. Yeah, I, yeah. Either way, or you could go to a monthly chart, I guess. But yeah, either way. Yeah. Let's look. Because uh... this is really, this is really a five-year-long kind of pattern that's built itself out, and there's a line that would connect all of those tops from from the 2014 highs through the 2016 highs through the 2017s. You could also pull up my. There you go. I mean, you can see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You can okay. see the basic yeah, idea so of what you I'm can see it. pointing right. out here. Right. right. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that has a very natural kind of breakout progression. And I think the bare picture for gold here would still probably include a test of 1,400 at this point. In my experience, when you get a pattern like this, it doesn't simply just roll over without blowing through those orders. And I think that blowing through those orders would mean moving up above the 2014 highs, which are maybe 1375 area, and I think that you'd be running yourself up through 1400 at that point. It is possible that you could do one, one thing that um, some of these large patterns like to do as they bloom at the end, because this suddenly looks like such a, a technically obvious level to push. Um, a lot of times you get a really terrible, really nasty shakeout right at the end, and it could blow all the way through the lows that we saw uh, a couple months ago, blow me right out of the position that I'm in, then turn around and two days later be at 1400. That kind of thing happens, and you got to watch out for it, and, and just don't be lazy. To go ahead and let the stop get hit, keep a close eye on it, put something small and wide on, let it run. It will just, the, the, the nice thing about that is, if that's what we do get, when you start to move back above 1340 again, the inevitability of the situation becomes, you know, beyond dispute. It's easier to pyramid on that type of move. You don't need to wait for pullbacks. You can simply start to increase size into that rally because you've, you've set that fake-out situation so powerfully that you know you're going to have a lot of people with stops up there to really just power through, and the market's just going to go on a straight line through them. So if you get that shakeout, it's going to feel bad if you... If, you, if you're in this, you're looking at this breakout right now, and you get shaken all the way down through that previous low. But, you know, it, it's really 
a situation where if it starts to creep back above 1325 to 1340 again, it just becomes about the easiest setup you can get to take you know, pretty considerable size on. So it actually ends up being something you probably end up making more money on to 1400 and above if it does that first. It's just not fun. So, so there's that pattern. And that's all tied in with the narrative that we talked about with the turtles and with the dollar and with everything else that we're seeing. So wouldn't you think, though, that uh, this would have more juice than just hitting a stop run out to 1400 Or is that just an initial target and you're going to hold this out it even is. longer? Oh, absolutely. That that's the, the so I often think of setups. Um, I, I, what what I really like about a setup is when I feel an extraordinarily high conviction about a close target, and then there are great possibilities beyond that. Um, but I know that I'm going to get that kind of power position or advantageous kind of situation, where it's going to give me an in the money position, the ability to tighten up my risk, and then what you and I intend to call a free look mm -hmm. from there forward. And and I would certainly be, yeah. I mean, I might scalp a piece at fourteen hundred to fourteen twenty five, um, but yeah. I mean, I I drew a big green circle around fifteen hundred in my notes this morning, which would be I think the natural progression. And I don't know what would come after that, and I suppose that that really you know is is indeterminate at this stage, and really has to do with how this conundrum that we outlined earlier in terms of monetary policy and where the cycle is, how that's all handled, and, and you know what the progression is, whether this is something that we haven't built up enough vulnerability to tip the cycle yet, um, so that conundrum really doesn't come strikingly into play over the near term. I think that would be the bear case for gold, that it blows out that level, hits 1,400, and stores up a ton of speculative interest, and then we start to see positive economic data. You know, the Fed has to move back into a tightening cycle. The world goes back into a happy place. You know, that's how you really reverse this. So, but I think you're still going to get 1,400 either way, most likely, even in that scenario. And and really, you know, how far above that you get just depends on how, how reality plays itself out. All right. Well, I'll definitely keep these on the radar. Uh, I'll keep this... Uh gold chart up uh, so I have it handy at least I'll try to uh, sometimes they don't always cooperate but uh, I'll try to keep it handy and with that said Brett uh, I'll keep you on the line uh, throughout the day in case you have another trade and you and Gavin might be able to walk through it uh, as always thanks for educating us and uh, giving your opinion on the markets and uh, giving us a philosophical lesson as well it is my pleasure Jim all right thanks a lot Brett take care